Good morning from beautiful Brisbane, Australia. How are you this morning? It's great to be here with you on CPTSD TV Live. My name's Linda. I'm your certified trauma recovery coach. And together we come in here and we do life together globally. So worldwide we join together and we learn as much as we can about CPTSD and we take the one next step. If you're here for the first time this morning, welcome. It's great to have you join us. Say good day and let me know where in the world you are today. And uh, are you enjoying it if it's winter? And if you're in Australia, it's so hot. We're in the last four weeks of summer. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the end of that. Now, today, I want to come in and be with you and share some information about the subtle signs that our trauma response is born. Now, this is really important for us because we know a lot about fight, flight, freeze, and we need to know about fawn. And, what, and for me, it was one of the changing points in my life where I was able to finally go, oh, so much makes sense now as to why the cycle continued. So welcome class, it's great to have you here with me. Now, one of the first signs is that we struggle to feel seen by others. So we, we're very focused on showing up in a way that makes those around us feel really, really comfortable and we do that to avoid conflict. So <laughs> I look back over my life and think, I had no idea that's the reason why I was always watching what other people needed and meeting their needs. But then, pardon me, at the end of the day, I'd go away and say, well, nobody saw me, okay? Pardon me. So it's something that gets developed in our childhood and we're not aware of it but the good news is when we develop an awareness around it we can begin to take whatever our one next step is to changing up how we approach it what we do so for me one of the first things i had to learn in this area is to learn to say yes or no as to what i can and can't do for people and that was really challenging for me, saying no the first time scared the living daylights out of me. Um, it felt like all the world was going to come crashing in on me if I said no. But over time, what I discovered was that when I said no, someone else stepped in and said yes, they could do it. And if you experiment with it, no matter how much we think there's no one else who can do it, there will be somebody who shows up and takes our place and, and can do it. Good morning, Laura. Um, another thing that we need to look at, so take an internal look at what is happening for us. Um, the other side of not saying no is so we don't know how to say no to people, so we have to learn that. And then we find that if we're not saying no, we stick our hand up for everything that happens. We, people say they have a need and we go, of course, yeah, I'm there, I can do that. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, I so used to do this all the time. Instead of saying, oh, look, I'm sorry, I can't do it right now. So even one of the first steps to saying no is being able to say, no, I can't do it right now, but I can fit it in there in this slot if it suits you as well. So we're making it mutually agreeable whether or not um, it can happen. Whatever needs to happen can happen. And then that gives the other person the right to say, well, no, I need it done before then. You say, well, that's okay, but I'm not your person. Okay. So it's learning how to navigate the language around it, which we weren't taught in childhood. And that's okay. Look, we're the first generation doing all of this work. So it's okay that we teach others what's happening as well, if they're interested you know, and give other people permission to say no as well. So one of the things I say to um, either my admin team, to my kids, uh, to my friends is, it's okay if you say no, I'm still going to be here. You know, I'm not running off, I can organise my life. 
that's not a problem. It's okay for you to say no too. So in us learning to say no, we're going to give other people permission to say no, which makes for really healthy relationships, okay? Um, we find that we keep our emotions held tightly in. And sorry, Sean, I just read your comment. Resource book, when I say no, I feel guilty by Manuel Smith. Okay, that sounds really good. So if you hear, uh, one of our global family members recommends a resource book. When I say no, I feel guilty by Manuel Smith. So get into it, okay? Because it helps the more information we have, the greater and not necessarily faster our recovery, but the more informed our recovery will be. And if it's more informed, then we're going to be able to help other people navigate the path with us as well. Okay, so another thing that I used to do, which I had no idea was related to the fawn response, was keeping my emotions packed down deeply inside. So I'd go out, you know, to a family gathering or a work meeting or whatever, and everything's packed down inside of me. And I'm able to respond in a way that's appropriate in the situation but I don't own how I'm feeling about it so I won't say look this is not going to work for me uh, I need to be able to navigate this in a different way now of course we're not going to go into our families and say I want to navigate this in a different way use your language but at least start thinking I want to find a different pathway through this because I don't want the same result doing the same thing the same way over and over again, all right? And, you know, we struggle because we get mad at people for not recognising what we need. But we need to be able to speak up. And one of our greatest challenges is to learn to use our voice. Now, if I'm on here speaking to you, we can all learn to use our voice and, and say, this is what I need now. And look, if that need changes, that's okay too. People will get educated from us saying, okay, if her needs can change, then my needs can too. And we can work together towards what the outcome is that we want to achieve. Uh, Laura says, yes, and I found myself preparing myself mentally and emotionally for the next fireball thrown at me oh, all the time. I take every situation and stretch it out and analyse as many possible outcomes as a way of handling constant traumatic and abusive outcomes. Extremely exhausting. And it is. When we are living our life in the space of, pardon me, Laura, I have to analyse everybody's possible movements through this then we need to do some work around breaking free, breaking the cycle of the fawn response because I know for me, I came out of my childhood like that, not knowing that this wasn't normal, that living life, it wasn't normal to have to analyse everything before you went into, for argument's sake, a family situation that you're supposed to be able to <laughs> turn up and just enjoy yourself and have conversations instead of having to go right now, if I say this, X, Y and Z will happen because I've made a comment about how I think or feel about a certain situation. And I don't want you to have to live like that. And one of the hardest things is we get to a point where there's, you know, we've had a lot of forgiveness in ourselves. We have a lot of understanding about our family. And then <laughs> for me, it's been years now and it's like, will I go back <laughs> you know or do I just keep the you know long even though they're down the road do I just keep the occasional interactions and for me it has to be the occasional interactions because I know that they've done no work to change that if I go back into that situation it'll be the same stuff different day different agenda but the same drama over and over again and our lives are so short, we just have to make a conscious choice whether we want to go back into that or not. Um, with the fawn response, we can feel guilty when we're angry at other people and that makes us shove our anger down, all right? So recognise the guilt. 
So we, we struggle. I know for me, I have struggled to be angry at people even when they're behaving badly. Oh my goodness. It, it is. It was really, really hard to develop that. Not explosive anger. I can't do anger. Um, I'd rather have peace. But when I get tired, I, there's a short string. Okay, but I admit it, if I'm tired, I taught my kids, because my kids, when they were in high school, it was like, mum, every night, you know, we get, you know, recovery is such a long journey, and every night I'd be getting my dinner, because they were able to organise their own, and I'd be, you know, cranky and tired, and just trying to keep my mind focused, and they'd be saying, mum, are you angry at us? I'm like, no, why? Why would you say that? And they said, well, we think you're angry at us. I said, no, I'm just tired. So it's being aware of what the our, what our hungry, angry, lonely or tired, when that comes up as well. And we're able to communicate. Communication is vital for healthy relationships. So we have to be able to be willing to communicate. Now, one of the things that we have to be aware of is that when somebody's behaving badly, we tend to blame ourselves. We blame ourselves for everything. And it's just a trauma response. Now, when I say just, I don't mean it's easy to overcome. I simply mean that we have to look at it, that this is a trauma response. So therefore, it's something that I can adapt and change, okay? Um, when we feel responsible for other people's behavior, we have to ask ourselves, do we feel 100% responsible for other people's happiness or can we sit in the pain with them and are they willing to do or to own their own emotional pain as well? So are they just going to keep acting out of that pain and like Laura said, throwing fireballs at us or are we able to just sit and be still and say, no matter what happens, we're going to find a way through this one step at a time. And look, when we first start this process, it's really, really hard because we've not had an example of it, but we can do it. I want to encourage you that we can do it. And with our kids, and this is what I've found with our children, because mine are adults now, is that they then be able to hold space for us and say, well, no, mum, this is what mine say to me, no, mum, you need to talk about this and you need to say what's really, really happening for you instead of shoving it down. And the first time that ever happened to me, Nicholas and I, were we'd, we'd gone shopping and I was tired and grumpy and, and he said something that just really triggered me and I was doing the trauma response of shoving the anger down and let's just get through this, the shopping that is. But we have a thing where Friday nights um, we take turns buying dinner, takeaway for dinner. And um, on the way to takeaway, he says to me, Mum, what's really going on for you? What's really happening for you? And because he asked that question, I'm sitting there driving, tears streaming down my eyes. And I'm like thinking this is really hard for me to even put words around because nobody's ever sat there and said what's really happening for you so uh, I was able to go right I've got to change this up I've got to be willing to say this is what's really happening for me and I don't know how to process it but if I talk about it then I'm going to find a way through all right that's how we change the trauma response uh, Laura says yes stepdad always came home drunk and on drugs the rage was always unpredictable he could flip out over a drop of water left on a dish that was just put away. Oh my goodness, I've so been there. So I feel, I really feel how traumatic that is for you. The kid's dad did this to me after a year of um, behaviour modification and not being angry. He came home and flipped out over plastic bags on the floor and I just went, yeah, yeah, I'm not doing this. The thing is, when we're kids, we can't get out of it. We've got nowhere to go. But as adults, we can then begin to make really healthier choices for us and our kids as well. And this is what we're doing. We're not going to get it right necessarily, but we are going to make progress and progress over perfection any day. All right. So 
you want to get to a stage where you can look back and even in the space of a month you can say yeah I've taken my one next step to making progress to not having the same trauma response again and it's it, Bessel van der Kolk even says it takes a lot of courage to do this work <laughs> Laura says your son Nick is amazing his interpersonal communication is beyond his years and very mature and awesome young man you're blessed Linda yeah he is he's very wise uh, but that's because him and I spent a lot of time together too when he was growing up because I was always very conscious of wanting to protect him um, he was one of the main reasons sorry oh can't wait for summer to be over itchy scratchy he was one of the main reasons I had to uh, make the decision to leave his dad because I didn't want him growing up with an angry father I was taught them that no matter what, no matter what, you will love your dad. You might not agree with his behaviour, but you will always love your dad. Because as adults, we need to be responsible for, you know, if we say to our kids, like give them, say things that are hateful about their parent, and we don't teach them that they will always love their parent, then we're the ones contributing to making their internal self not congruent, not add up. We're saying that, you know, on one hand, you can be somebody who's filled with love and kindness and caring and compassion. But on the other hand, you know, you better hold this small bit of hate in you for that parent who did you wrong. No, we can't do that. We have to be willing to... to if you want to put it in these words, be the bigger person and say, you will always love your dad, mum, whoever it is. No matter what, you will always love them. And that is the healthy thing to say. You may not like their behaviour all the time, but you will always love them. And that makes sure that we're not doing damage at a heart level, heart and soul level to our kids. And at the time, I didn't know any other way to navigate it. I just knew that it was a healthy thing that we love our children. We teach them the difference between love and whether, you know, trauma response, don't have the trauma response that we were raised with, um, teach them something better than what we had. Uh, we often feel responsible for other people's reactions. So the questions we need to ask ourselves are, where where does my responsibility lie in this okay so we have to be willing to look at their adults and they choose their behavior and this is one of the things that is like my pet bugbear that people go oh you've got a mental health condition therefore you're going to be x y and z well no i've got challenges but that doesn't change who i am as a person I'm not going to be some angry Annie from Whoop Whoop just because I've got challenges. I'm an adult and it's up to me to guide and direct how I behave. My behaviour, I'm accountable for that. And if another adult's acting out, then they're accountable for what they do, okay? It's not our, it's not our responsibility how other people choose to behave. And I was actually in a group last night and not my group this is another group and someone came at me and and I said listen I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's okay you're allowed to see my name and you're allowed to keep scrolling I'm not going to post stuff that everybody agrees with that's life if we go through life wanting everybody to agree with us then we're going to end up very very unhappy we need to give other people permission to not like us. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And that's okay. Um, we're not here to have everyone like us or love us. And, and the same, not everybody's my cup of tea. And that's okay. All right. But it doesn't mean we can't learn from each other or be in the same space as each other. So I'm going on a bit of a rant this morning. Uh, Sean says, learn long ago that by our dad's behavior was toxic learned that he loved but did not care yeah thus I was able to not I was able to no longer care for him 
Yeah. Good morning, Jilly. Good morning, Sharon. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're able to take a step back. We're able to see how much they'll give. And it's not that you look in relationships as an equal giving process, but if they're not at least meeting you in a space of caring for each other, I mean, think about our circles of layers of friendship, just how far are we going to let somebody in who's not doing their own internal work? Well, we're not anymore. We've come this far. Uh, I'm not going to let somebody in who's not doing their work and is not going to adult. We work too long and too hard for this. Um, I want us to remember that we don't need to compromise our values and sit down and make a list of 10 values that are really, really important for you. But our trauma response will have us compromising those values. So one of the values that's really important to me is integrity. So I always, I raise my kids with the attitude of, tell me the truth and there's no consequences outside of what I can't control. So if you misbehave at school, I can't control it. But if you tell me the truth at home, there's no consequences, but we'll work through a way to better behavior. And you know what? Best thing I ever did because it saves a lot of time. But then people outside our home, we've got no control over what they're going to say or do. So we have to be willing to go, that's not in my area of responsibility. And I used to spend hours, <laughs> like Laura said, hours working out how I could navigate interacting with other people. I can laugh now, but it wasn't funny at the time. I ended up with migraines from it. Um, I can laugh, yeah, sorry, I can laugh now, but I used to spend hours navigating how am I going to, well, pre-preparing, how I'm going to navigate interacting with other people, hoping that they wouldn't be angry at me. You know, look, if you need to be angry at me, that's okay, but let's sit down and work through how we can do this better. Good morning, lovely. Um... Sometimes we dissociate in social situations. Now, I want you to feel really compassionate for yourself because we didn't, you know, I explain our brain like, you know, a whole bunch of apps that have got to work together and function together and they've all got to be booted up properly to work together. And the social side of life is something that we didn't get uh, instruction from instruction in part of our life so when I look back at the women in my family heritage they didn't have a lot of well they didn't have any close friends so one of my nans was brought up in a paid position in an orphanage so social things weren't her, her um, she never had an experience of it in a family so I don't think my nan ever had a close friend that I'm aware of and same with my other men, acquaintances, but no close friends. My mum, she had friends and close friends, but not a lot. There wasn't a lot of social happening. So if we're not exposed to social situations a lot in childhood, we don't understand the subtleties of it. And for those of us with Asperger's, we don't stand a chance. It's like having the double dose of, um, yeah, we've got to go and learn social skills. Laura says, we learn through the tragedy of traumas what we will and will not allow in our lives. Exactly. The bad behaviours were allowed wake-up call to turn away and do what's right and to look inside as there were no models in our lives. Absolutely. And the good thing that I've found is that if I be, when I began to look for role models, they began to appear as well. But it takes a lot to be willing to look. For me, it took a lot to be willing to look because it's like, am I going to make a healthy choice here? So I tend to sit back now and just observe before I make decisions. And then we've got to look at self-trust. We've got to ask. Am I able to trust myself in making decisions? And then we learn how to build trust into ourselves. Like what, it, what does it mean for us that I can trust myself to make a decision? And when we ask the question, it then become, you can then lay out step by step what it would mean that I can make a decision based on what I know 
and I can make a decision based on what are the next five steps that I can see after that will happen after I make this decision. And that really helped me because it helped me sit down, even navigating relationships. Like I'm single and happy, but when people come into my life, it's like if I made a decision with, you know, to see this person or go out or whatever, what are the next five steps that I can see happening from there? And you know what? I've made the best friends, intelligent men, because I've been able to be upfront and honest and it breaks, it actually breaks the trauma response that used to keep me choosing the same type of men. So now I'm able to say, look, this is where I'm going in my life. This is what I'm building in my life and what I hope to achieve. And then I'm able to see whether that person had come into my life and build with me or not. And then we're able to say, right, well, that doesn't really fit. And I'm not going to force anything, okay, over that. If I'm forcing something, it's a trauma response and I've got to look at my internal work. But now I say, this is where I am. This is where I'm going. This is what I hope to achieve. And now I can have intelligent conversations with intelligent men because they know, they know this is who I am, this is where I'm going, this is what I want to achieve. And if it doesn't line up, then we end up with a really good friend. Okay? All right, I won't keep you anymore this morning. Thank you so much for chatting. I want you to remember above and beyond everything else, you are loved, you are needed here, and it matters. It matters that you do this work so that you can have a healthy and whole life too. Have the most wonderful weekend. And I will see you again Monday morning. Bye for now.